Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you have your Bibles, open them to Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. And Zephaniah is right after the book of Habakkuk and right before the book of Haggai. is towards the very end of the Old Testament as you get close to the New Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. And the question we're asking simply this morning is this. Can we really be joyful all the time? Can we truly have joy at every moment of our lives? That's the question we're asking as we look now to Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. The prophet says, Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away His judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst. A victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in His love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They come from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, even at that time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for your love and for your mercy in our lives. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the joy that you freely give to all those who would turn to Christ for salvation. Lord, we ask that you would be with us now. We pray that you would speak to our hearts today. God, speak a fresh word to us. Lord, we pray that if there be any here who do not know You as Lord and Savior, that You would draw them to Yourself, that You would give them the gift of conviction of sin and show them where the answer is found in Jesus Christ alone. God, we pray that You would speak to our hearts today that Your people would be edified. And Lord, help us to know what it is to live a life of joy in Christ Jesus. And it's in His precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. I would take a poll and ask for a show of hands of how many of you, your favorite book in the Bible is Zephaniah, uh, but a real more realistic poll may have been how many of you knew Zephaniah was in the Bible. Uh, ultimately, it's not a book that gets a lot of fanfare. It's not a book that gets talked about all that often. And so when we have a passage from a book like Zephaniah, we need to understand what's going on. We need to know the context so that we can understand the text itself. And the context at this time, at this time in history, we find Israel, God's people, who time and time and time again had rebelled against the Lord. Time and time again, they had turned away from the Lord their God. Time and time again, they had gone after their sins and after false idols and false gods. And we hear that and we may think, now what's the big deal that Israel did that? Surely a lot of nations and a lot of people were very far from the Lord but the reason this mattered was this. 
When God created humanity, He made us in His image. He made us to be His ambassadors, to reflect His image. He made us to be in personal relationship with Him forever, never having to worry about death. And yet as humanity, as human beings, we sinned against the Lord. We turned away from God. We turned away from the only source of life to ourselves, to creation, to death and corruption. And theologically, we call this the fall. It means we sinned against God and thus we are born into sin. And to this day, we choose sin. Now, God had no obligation to try to do anything about that. God was in no way obligated to save us or to come after us. We were the ones who were made out of His love for us, and then we turned from Him. And yet, God in His mercy pursues human beings. He pursues us and desires for us to once again be restored to relationship with Him and to once again have eternal life. And so, He chose a people through the line of Abraham, and this would be the people of Israel. Israel and he would have a special covenant relationship with them he would be their God and they would be his people and through them all people of all nations would be able to look to Israel and see who God is see the character of God and desire to come back to him but Israel failed time and time again They continued in their sin and they continued to turn away from the Lord. And so in the entire book of Zephaniah, the prophet Zephaniah is prophesying to the people and he's telling them the whole book about the terrible judgment that they're going to face because of their sinfulness. The terrible judgment they're going to face because they'd failed the covenant. They'd failed to be the people of God. They'd failed to be God's representatives. And so you would think as we come to the very end of that book that it would be very depressing and very gloomy and very dark to read. But instead it ends with a great encouragement to shout for joy verse 14 verse 14 shout for joy O daughter of zion shout in triumph O israel rejoice and exult with all your heart O daughter of jerusalem now it begs the question why if they're facing so much judgment what is there to celebrate and we continue in verse 15 it says the lord has taken away his judgments against you He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord, your God, is in your midst. A victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in His love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. God says that all of those judgments that are against you, everything that you so righteously deserved because of your sins, I am going to remove. He is going to take away His judgments against His people. He is going to clear away their enemies who had been sent to them as punishment for their sins. And it says that the Lord, the King of of Israel will be in their midst. And you'll notice he uses the past tense there. He talks about it like it's already a done deal. But this is still prophecy. Zephaniah is still telling what God is going to do for His people. The past tense there emphasizes it's a done deal. It shows that this is a guarantee. It has been decided by the Lord. Verse 16 says, do not let your hands fall limp. And that's talking about someone being gripped with fear so much that they freeze, right? They lose their motor control. They lose uh, their hands to even be able to move them up. They fall limp. That's the kind of fear that the wrath of Almighty God brings. And yet there he says, don't be afraid. Verse 17, again, The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in His love. 
He'll rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Many of you know how it felt when you were dating your spouse and you began to realize early on that you wanted to marry that person. And there was probably a moment at some point when you held one another and it was a moment too good for words. You didn't even speak. You just quietly loved. Or some of you know what it feels like the very first time you held your child in your arms. And in that moment, words didn't matter. Words couldn't have expressed how you felt. You just simply looked and adored and quietly loved that child. The prophet here tells us that God will be quiet in His love. And literally the picture that's given there is this, that God will be like one who is quietly contemplating His love. Completely content in the one he adores. One of the most foolish heresies that man ever came up with is that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. And we know that that's not the case at all. People have said that in the New Testament, God is a God of love. And we see how much He loves us when He takes on flesh and He comes down and represents His people and He dies for our sins. But they say in the Old Testament, God is a God of wrath, tolerating absolutely no evil and punishing all wickedness and all sin. But the idea that it's two different gods is not true at all. And here in Zephaniah, we get the perfect balance of God's character. Yes, God will punish the wicked. Yes, God will punish sin. God is just. God is fair. And we rejoice that God is going to punish evil. We rejoice that God is going to set things right. He is going to bring justice into an unjust world. And yet God is also loving. God is is tender. God is much more merciful than a sinful man such as myself could ever deserve or could ever be. And God removes the sins of those who repent, those who turn away from sin. He removes the sins of those who repent and believe on Jesus Christ. No matter how wretched of a person, No matter how vile a person might be, He is the God of second chances. He is the God who saves. He is the God who takes us just as we are in our messiness and in our filth and by the almighty power of His grace cleanses us from our sins. And it says here that His love is tender toward those He saves from sins, and he rejoices over them. The Lord rejoices over those he saves. And how great his salvation is. Verse 18, the Lord now speaking says this, I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They come from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. Even at the time when I gather you together, indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. God promises He's going to gather up, He's going to bring in those who grieve. How many of you have grieved this year? The Lord is going to gather us in. God is going to deal with our oppressors, it says in verse 19. And you know the Scripture says that death is our enemy. Death is an oppressor. And that the last enemy that Christ shall destroy will be death. He will deal with our oppressors. 
He's going to save the lame. I mean, those who are crippled or handicapped will be restored. He's going to gather the outcasts, the marginalized, the poor, the widows, the orphans, the babies killed by the abortion industry, those who have been molested. And he's going to turn their shame into praise and renown throughout all the earth. Brothers and sisters, we are called to rejoice Because Jesus, our King, has come. And Jesus, our King, is coming again. And when He comes, He is going to save. He is going to redeem. He is going to restore. He is going to rescue His people. And when He does, He will be in our midst. And He will rejoice over us and be quiet over us in His love. That is reason To rejoice. Now we look around practically. And we may ask the question, what reason do I have to rejoice? Why should I rejoice? How many of you have been saved? Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. That's reason to give praise to God. If you've truly been saved, you know what that love from God feels like. You know what it's like to have Him adore over you. You know what it's like to want to shout for joy because of His love. How many of you were blessed today to see three young people baptized and making a public profession of their faith in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. What a beautiful moment in our church. What a beautiful moment to see and to rejoice over. We have a lot to be thankful for today. We have a lot of reasons to rejoice. How many of you are glad that God is still in the business of saving people? That God is still moving in our midst and in our community. Still a God who is mighty to save. Who is mighty to accept us into His arms just as we are. And who loves us immensely. Folks, we have reason to rejoice. With what the scripture calls a joy unspeakable, a joy inexpressible and full of glory. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If you don't know that joy, if you don't know what it is to feel God's love for you and that you love God, if you've never felt God rejoicing over you and quiet over you in his tender love for you, you need to be saved. You need Christ in your life. You need Him in your midst, in your heart. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 says this, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In Philippians 4, 4 and 5, The Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all. The Lord is near. He is near. One of the big questions today a lot of people wonder about is why people aren't really drawn to come to a church anymore. And there's several factors that go into that. There's several things They can cause that, but I can share with you a big factor of why people aren't drawn to come to church is because they don't see joy in the lives of the Christians they know. I wonder how many times in our community do lost people see Christian folks moping around, unhappy, mad, down in the dumps, acting like they've got absolutely nothing to live for. Brothers and sisters, that's a terrible, terrible witness. And if every Christian in the world moped around 24-7, looking like they were the saddest people on the planet, like they'd never had any fun a day in their lives, well, I wouldn't want to be a part of that church either. Why on earth would anyone be drawn to that? Who could possibly want to live a life like that? Well, brother so-and-so, he goes down to such-and-such church. He's miserable all the time. I think I'll go check it out. I need a little misery in my life. But folks, I'm going to tell you, on the other hand, people want to know their Creator. 
People are truly hungry to have a relationship with their Creator God. And what better life to live than a life where He rejoices over us and we have the privilege of shouting for joy over what He has done in our lives. It was during the Christmas season when I was still a lost atheist in 2003. And the Lord showed me through His people what joy looked like, what joy in Christ looked like. Because I saw people who had the joy of His salvation. People who couldn't wait to get out and serve Him and do acts of ministry. People who couldn't wait to come to church and study their Bibles and couldn't wait to get together with their brothers and sisters in Christ and worship the Lord. And folks, I look around and a lot of us need to look in the mirror. And we need to ask, is that what someone sees out of me? We're called to rejoice. Not to grumble, not to complain, not to mope, not to whine, not to argue. As Christian people, we rejoice. And as Christian people, we keep our focus on King Jesus. And when there is an issue and something needs to be addressed, we take it to our King Jesus. And again, a reason for that call in verse 14 to shout for joy, to rejoice and exult with all our hearts is found in verse 15. Verse 15, it says this, The Lord has taken away His judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to share with you that as a believer, in my life as a believer and as a follower of Jesus, there have been moments in my life of following Christ when I was down. Down. Because here's the thing, I'm not dumb. That's real life. That's what life looks like. Life gets messy. Life can be painful. Life can be extremely unfair. And when the time comes in your life when death has visited your home and a loved one dies, we would be absolute fools Dance around and smile. Tell everybody, oh, nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong at all. Or when a horrible act of injustice is perpetrated in our community or in our midst, we would be absolute cowards not to speak out with a righteous indignation and demand justice. You cannot always be happy. But folks, where we mess up is we need to understand there is a difference. There is a huge difference between happiness and joy. Okay, because happiness is circumstantial. It's based on your circumstances. A lot of time, you can't even do anything about those. Happiness is circumstantial. And things change. Circumstances change. But joy is eternal. Because it's based solely upon the one who does not change. Who never changes. Who is always faithful. Jesus Christ. So understand, I don't want you to feel bad if you've had a bad day. My job isn't to hurt people who are broken hearted. I don't want you to feel bad if you've had a bad week or a bad month or if you're going through a season of life right now where you're struggling. Okay, being hurt and being in pain and being heartbroken doesn't make you a bad person. But what you need to see this morning is simply this. 
If you know Jesus Christ, if you've been saved through the grace of Jesus, you have reason to have joy. You have reason to rejoice because you have a promise that through the perspective of eternity, God is going to correct everything that is wrong in this world and in this life. God is going to bring justice and peace. And as a part of that, that means He's going to rescue you. He's going to rescue you. And He covers you in His love. He surrounds you with adoration now in Christ. Now sometimes situations can really knock us off the path. It really calls us to lose sight of the hope that we have of the joy that is eternal in Christ. And so I want to share with you three very simple ways that you can know that you can cling to the reality of the joy that Christ gives. Three simple ways. And that is through reading your Bible every day. Praying every day. And living a life of obedience to God. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Obey God in all you do. Now, some of you are disappointed because it may not seem very profound. We like to have a magic bullet. We like to have something that's going to fix things right now. Fix it yesterday. But I can tell you every single time, not one exception, every single time a brother or sister in Christ has gone through a struggle with their faith, or they've struggled with doubt, or they've struggled and said, I don't have any joy in my life. Every single time. The question I'll ask, do you read your Bible every day? Do you pray every day? And are you obeying God? And without exception, in at least one of those areas, the answer is always no. No. Now here's what happens. Because we're just people. Sinful people. But we will be longing to be closer to the Lord. And He's made it very obvious how we can be closer. Read His Word. His inspired Word where He speaks plainly to us. You want to know what God has to say to you and not doubt whether or not He's saying it. Here it is. But He also wants us to pray. And He wants us to communicate with Him. It's a two-way relationship. We truly have fellowship with God. And so He wants us to pray and He wants us to show that we trust Him and that we pour our burdens out to Him. But we also must obey. We must worship together. We must gather as He's called us to do. We must share our faith. We must give of our tithes and offerings. We must serve others. We must be a servant to all. We must humble ourselves. The commands that Christ has given us. But what will happen so very often is we're struggling and then a great worship service comes along or a retreat that we go on or something really picks us up. Say, okay, now I'm ready. I'm on fire for the Lord. I'm close with Him. I'm ready to walk with Him every day. And we have all the best intentions in the world and we come home and we're about to read that Bible passage, maybe just one chapter today. But you know, I think I'll just watch one episode. My favorite TV show first. Just one. Just one while I'm eating, right? Or I'll read this magazine first. A few articles, no big deal. Then I'll read this passage of Scripture. Then I'll pray. Then I'll go talk to my neighbor. Or you know, I got all these chores to do. I got this homework to do. I'll do that first. Do that first. Get that out of the way. Then I won't have any distractions. And three or maybe four or maybe five or maybe six months later, we're right back where we were, kicking ourselves and wondering, does God really love me? I tell you, if you didn't talk with your spouse for six months, you probably wonder if they loved you as well. We're called to draw near to Him. And He's provided very simple ways 
It's not a hard thing to read our Bibles and to pray and to obey Him. Not just not do the things we're not supposed to do, but do the things that He's called us to do. Do the acts of faith He's called us to. But understand, all of this is how a person who has a relationship with Jesus draws near to Him and clings to the joy that He gives. But if you've never been saved, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have a personal relationship with Him, here's what you need to understand. God loves you very much despite your sin. And God Himself, recognizing that Israel couldn't do it, recognizing that people couldn't do it, recognizing we were failures, God Himself came down in the flesh and He lived a perfect life. And He perfectly represented who He was for us that we would know Him. And then He suffered and died in our place on a cross to pay the price for our sins. And after He was completely dead and buried, on the third day of being buried, He rose up from the dead. And He lives today and He is ready and willing to receive all who would turn from their sins and believe in Him. All who would desire salvation and deliverance. He is ready to save. That you would find the promise of verse 15 fulfilled in your life. That the Lord has taken away His judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. He's in your heart. He's in your life. And now, you may fear disaster no more. Because disaster is a circumstance. But joy in Christ is eternal. If you don't know Him today, would you come and receive Him as your Lord and Savior as we pray this morning?